Roger, thank you so much for joining the show. Really excited to have you on. No, pleasure. No, always always nice to chat to, to, to another sportsman. <laughs> no, no, appreciate it. Look, um, with, with everything that we always start on the show, I usually start off with just some moments of inspiration or early days for you that really got you kickstarted into your running career, really, for you. So like, what can well, you, do you have like an earliest memory that you can think yeah, of where you've I got mean, passion for it? Um, well, so f- firstly, just to, to sort of feel, I didn't take up athletics seriously till I left school at 18. So I have to, to throw that out there. So I'm not the young kid that, you know, I, my business partner's a guy called Steve Backley, who's a javelin thrower, mm, multiple yeah. worker. And when we speak together, you know, present together, and we have two very different stories. He remembers vividly being seven years old, watching the Olympics on telly and a little flame in his belly got lit. And that was it. You know, right, from the yeah, age okay. of seven, join the athletics club. I'm going to go to the Olympics. I was not that kid. Uh, not at all. But to answer your question, I knew the day I knew I was fast. I mean, I was always fast. And, you know, yeah, you're kicking a football, you, you, you're playing rugby. You, you can just get to balls before everyone else you can just you know football was kick it over the top and Roger will you know hopefully score or at least I get a chance so I knew I was quick the day I actually <laughs> knew I was quick weirdly uh, was I raced my my family back from church on a Sunday and I decided to run home and they would uh, my brothers would like uh, cycle home or get in the car or something like that and and I ran as hard as I could to get home so it's, it's probably a probably a mile okay in the village maybe less than a mile and I got home before them. And I remember the look on their faces. And I think that was the day I thought I was pretty quick. There was also a day at school when I ran the, the school sports 100 meter race. And I was I was two years below the other two guys who were the fastest guys in the school. They were older than me. And I, I won by a, a long margin in a 100 meter race against one guy who went on to play rugby for, for Harlequins called Mike, Mike Wedderburn, who was fast. He was two years older than me, he was fast. These guys were fast and older than me. And I won and I and I won it. And the look on their faces, I'll never forget that look. And I sort of thought, blimey, actually, I am quite quick. You know, that, that's when I knew. Um, but of course, you don't know how good you are until you, you run with good people. So yeah. I became an athlete because I messed up my A-levels. I was going to be a doctor. I messed up my mass A-level, got rejected from Bart's Hospital, had to take a year off. And I, I was quick. You know, I, I'd never joined a club. But I, I was known in Hampshire for being that kid that always wins the Hampshire schools, but you never see him again. Yeah. I went to the English schools championships twice or three times, made the final on each occasion in the 200 metres on no training. You know, I played rugby at school. So I had the talent. But then you know, I had a year off before re- retaking my maths exam to, to hopefully then go on to read medicine. And that changed my life. I mean, I joined. I was, uh, geography is a huge part of, of anyone's success. Mm. And I lived in, in Gosport near Portsmouth on the south coast. But the best 400 meter training group in the country was in Southampton. Uh, a coach called Mike Smith was coaching a big group of athletes, including two guys, one called uh, Todd Bennett, who was um, went on to be the world indoor record holder. And a guy you probably heard of called Chris Akabusi. Yeah, yeah. And I went along as this sort of spotty 18 year old in my rugby kit. And these guys were, <laughs> I'll never forget it, Monday night, Thorn, Thornhill social you know it was an old old hut you know it was an old gym and they were in the you know the sponsor kit sponsor cars and everything and i just thought what am i doing here and i just basically chased them up a hill for about four weeks and that was it and then i suppose as corny as it sounds i caught them and the rest is history so so yeah I'm, i mean i am i mean i'm an example of of a kid that had load of talent but i didn't know you don't know how good you are until yeah. you you measure up against really good people and mm. yeah i mean that, that that's that's it that's how it happened I, I want to delve into that sort of measuring up against better people i kind of want to go into i'm going to put a pin in that for the moment but um, yeah, sure. I, I i'm interested like because coming in at 18 that is yeah. that is relatively late like a lot of people late. a lot of people will i mean i was i was 14 when i definitely started sort of yeah. going into my my career yeah and, and yeah must have been a lot of other pressures around at being 18 of like um, worlds opening up a little bit. There's obviously the yeah. education route. Yeah. There's your friends going out, drinking, partying. Yeah. Like, was well, any of that I was, attractive? I was too. I was too. Right. You know, I did the drinking. I did the smoking. I did it all. I didn't miss out on my teenage years. So me coming into sport at 18, on one hand, was brilliant because I thought I hadn't missed out on anything. Yeah. 
um I feel for kids that start at 10, you know, miss out on 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 that day because mm. you, you have to be focused. So on that side, mentally, it was really positive. And I'm not alone. I mean, Chris Akabusi came to the sport late. Linford Christie came to the sport late. It, you know, Jonathan Edwards came to the sport relatively late. It's not, there's something in that. I'm not recommending it, but, no, but there's something yeah. in that. The flip side to it was I came into that environment physically as a kid who played football on a Sunday for a Sunday league football, who played rugby for the school and for the county, never, never warmed up, never stretched, never touched my toes, and then turned up to train every day with a world-class training group. And within two years, I'd broken my foot. So yeah, that's the downside. My body was not, I was, I got away with it for a year. My body was never conditioned to, yeah. to, 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 to do that. So mentally it was great because I thought this is brilliant. You know, I wasn't burnt out at 18. I'd only started. It's brilliant, you know. Yeah. So mentally, it was all, I was a kid. But physically, it, it found me out. What do you think that people could take from that era then? Those, like I said, those guys starting later, those guys sort of being, coming in uh, probably with less expectation or pressure? On, there, was on no, there was no expectation and no pressure. There was certainly no parental pressure. My father had nothing. My parents had nothing to do with my athletics career. I mean, right. <laughs> literally nothing. I mean, it was complete, you know, um, and it was fine. You know, it was fine. You know, I mean, um, I, I need to qualify one thing in this. It's quite important. I was a runner. Right, yeah. You can't do this in other sports. I'm not sure you can do it in cricket, actually. You certainly can't do it in football, I don't think. you, certainly you mean, can't, coming, in, you, coming in later? You can't come in late. You can't do it in yeah. gymnastics. For the majority of sports, you've got to start early. And there's a simple reason for that. You've got to learn the skill. Mm. Running is a minimal skill sport. There is a skill to running, but, but you can become an international athlete on, on minimal skill and a lot of natural talent. Okay, You can't win an Olympic medal on minimal skill and a bit of talent. Mm. Mm -hmm. To win an Olympic medal, you have to have a huge amount of skill and and athletic intellect. So let's call it that. I think all sports have a an intellect, yep. and that's called training, and that takes years. And you also have to have talent. So at, I think I think running is is such a natural sport. You're you're not you're not reacting to anybody. I wasn't reacting. You you're a bowler. You're bowling. The batsman's going to react to you. You're reacting to what comes back at you and what goes forward. There's, you're having to adapt to everything around you. I ran round the track once hmm. and, and it never changed. And um, there was a purity and a simplicity to that that allows somebody who has a bundle of talent, but just for whatever reason, hasn't gone down the track and trained with, and with, with other people. I think you can do that in running. I certainly don't. I think it's a lot harder in lots of other sports. I think there's there's obviously that kind of 10,000 hours that you have to put in and repetition yeah. that's got to come on early and running. Yeah. Obviously, if you're running already, like you're getting that 100% in a, a sport like mine, cricket, you, there's no yeah. way you could get away without some real foundational yeah. skills. And I, and I actually, that's a in a sport like that in, in cricket, where there's a high technicality to the sport, yeah. it's really hard right now for young people to like not, want to do well they don't want to do those foundational skills they don't want to just set in that bedrock because they want to do the the advanced stuff yesterday yeah. <laughs> they want to have yeah. been able to do that i think there's a beauty with running and i did a bit of swimming training before and, and i think when you especially when you jump in a pool you realize there is a place where i want to get to but it is going to require the the entry level to get to that is literally time in the pool or time on track and there's yeah that amount yeah. of repetition that you've got to get yeah. to get your engine to get all that foundational ability technique yeah. and yeah, yeah it's definitely that that side of it is a huge part you've got to put the hours in and 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 i certainly would never say oh yeah you know i just turned up and i was i mean i was actually an international athlete within two months of training but 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 the journey then to the olympic rostrum was 10 years later mm. and, and and a lot of hours and a lot of ups and a lot of downs so you know, talent will give you a head start over over the over the rest, but it won't get you to the to the finishing line. Do you think for the era that you're in, because it was quite yeah. a seminal era in it British was. athletics as well, <laughs> do you think now there's a bigger pool of athletes that people have got to fight past to 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 get to that level? Is it in and also the no. the times is still similar? I don't know the sport. I don't know the intricacies of like the talent development. Yeah, you know, and I and I don't I don't know, but I I think there's a smaller pool now. Interesting. You know, when I was competing, it was a very, very popular sport. 
it was on television you know we had three channels on tv it was on you know it was on a friday night you know it was on the back page it was on the front page i mean we owed everything i think i think the sport in britain you know that i was part of that generation that came off the back of of, of fundamentally two maybe three people who without whom i mean one of my closest friends in the sport is a guy called daley thompson who's a two-time yeah. olympic decathlon and he always said to me we owe all of this to seb and steve which is seb mm-hmm. co and steve ovet because basically you know you, you back in the the whatever it was, early 80s, late 70s, Steve Ovet and Seb Coe um, swapped world records over a period of time and took the attention of the whole nation. And off the back of that, athletics became a, you know, a very popular television sport. And people like myself and, and, and Linda Christie and, and Sally Gunnell, Colin Jackson, Chris Akabusi, mm-hmm. Steve Blackley, Denise Lewis, and the list goes on and on and on. John Regis, you know, it, it's a big list. Fatty Whitbread, Cecil Sanderson, we all benefited, and Daly will always say it was it was Seb Co and Steve Ovet that that catapulted our sport into the public eye. So it was a very popular sport, and there were lots of people doing it back then. Um, I don't know now whether as many kids are doing athletics. I think other sports have caught up. Other, I think if you're competing for talent, I think you know, I think I think talented kids have gone to other sports because, being, being brutally honest with you, you know, the, there's more chance of success if if you're in a if you're in a team sport and there are lots of clubs out there, football, cricket, rugby, you've got more chance of making a living than athletics. Mm. You know, you have to be one of the very best in the world to make a living athletics. Not not the best in the country. You 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 really do have yeah. to be. And so, I, I I think it's I think it's tough. I think it's tough nowadays. I really do. You spoke about you not having much parental expectation and yeah. things around that. What was what was your experience? Right. Yeah. Well, my, my my father was a doctor. My mum was a, a nurse. Um, the I, medical I, I side makes I sense I now. Didn't, I didn't need motivating. You know, I, I, I loved sport. You know, I, I ran around every day of my life. I kicked a football until 10 o'clock at night. I played rugby at school. I played I was rubbish at cricket, but you know, I'll play cricket. You know, I... I I ran around all the time. I didn't do athletics because I liked team sport. I didn't like individual sport. I wanted, basically, I liked to play with my mates. Um, that's Athletics doesn't allow that. So, yeah, it was football, predominantly football, um, and then rugby because I went to a rugby playing school and, and academics. You know, I went to grammar school. So, but, yeah, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not someone who was sitting around watching telly all day. I, I, out of choice, I was playing sport. I just wasn't ever thinking this is a career. I mean, it's it laughable. I mean, it's laughable. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember going to the pub after we finished our A-levels with three or four other gu- friends. And they'll all back this up, by the way. And we sat in the pub and they said, what do you think we'll all be doing in two or three years' time? And I never once said that I would be a professional athlete. Within, within a year and a half of that, I was Commonwealth European champion. And they were all vouched for that. Never once said that. Mm. Because it wasn't, it just wasn't, it wasn't in my life. It wasn't my culture. It wasn't, no one in my life was doing that. Yeah. It wasn't, yeah. You know. Do you think that's taken a, that, that's taken a lot of pressure? You spoke about having academics on the side, right? It took loads of pressure right? off. I had so no that, pressure at all. I had no pressure so, at all. So having that kind of other journey you probably assumed you might be going on, I'm going towards academics, I want to be a doctor. This yeah, is I was going to be a doctor, yeah. So then sort of athletics becomes secondary, No right? pressure. It, becomes, it was yeah. absolutely, Lewis, it was a complete result. It was like, because I knew, and I wasn't, I, I may not have even made it as a doctor. I mean, I did start. I did actually start, yeah. being medicine, but I left, I left. Yeah, I, I, look, it wasn't my passion. I never thought I could make a career out of athletics. I, one, I didn't know I was that good. And two, I didn't know the vehicle. I didn't know how it worked. And I had no one to show me. But I had no pressure. I had no expectation. It was just from the day I started, it was, this is fantastic. This is, I can't, this is Chris Akabusi, Daily Top, all these amazing people. And suddenly I'm, I'm running and I'm running for Britain. And what's this, what's happening? It didn't last for long, by the way, yeah. <laughs> because then I broke my foot and it became very serious. But, but I feel very fortunate though, though I, I don't know what it's like to have any parental pressure as a kid to do well. And yeah. I've tried to do that to my children as well. Cause you know, um, it's, it's I'm, it's, I'm, 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 and my your dad, sorry, I'm talking too much, but my dad always felt bad about that. My parents saw me run. Okay, mm. they went to, they saw me run. A, 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 they they did go to the Barcelona Olympics, which was awful for me. I didn't want to, you know. They saw me run. You could count on one hand how many times right. they saw me run. Now that wasn't because they didn't want to. 
it is because they knew that I didn't really need them to be involved. Um, and they never, it just, they weren't involved. And it freed me up to be me when I was with my family. It, it, my motivation came from within. And I think, I think I was very fortunate to have that. I didn't feel I had to prove anything to my, to my parents. And I realise now that although my father felt he should have got involved more, I thank him for that. And I did thank him for that. Yeah. Because without knowing, he he freed me to take accountability for my career rather than try and do it for him. And I think that was great. Yeah, I, there's a real running theme with a lot of people that have been <laughs> on the show. Like the, the people that have definitely in in sort of inverted commas made it in their sport and, and had success, the, the parental guidance has been minimal and been and really the expectation yeah. has been it's a real theme and i and i i can even just see in my journey i'm sure you maybe saw in yours where there isn't a, a parent that's heavily involved and how how pressured that becomes sometimes for that person yeah, it's just the expectation you just see them like seize up and very similar to me but my parents my parents didn't come to again i probably count on only two hands like the amount of games they really i, I can like remember them being in the crowd and stuff like that and even the days when they were there, there's there's just this like little added thing that's on there that I didn't need, that I didn't really need it, but it was there. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't massive, but it's like, oh, is that just a I, I didn't change a decision? Name. Yeah, I right. Didn't want, my parents did go to the Barcelona Olympics. I didn't want them there. Yeah. Just the thought of them being there was not a good thing for me. I just, I, I didn't want to have to think about anybody or anything outside of what I was doing. Yeah, I, I think for parents, I'm not a parent. I don't have a, I don't have a, like I've said, I don't have a horse in that race right now, so, but I have been a son and I, yeah. I can always tell that like I know, and even when I see like young athletes now where their parents are in every conversation, they're in every moment of that young person's upbringing in their sport, they're robbing them of their autonomy and that intrinsic motivation that you can self-drive yourself. And mm. when they rob them of that, like when, shit hits the fan and you've actually got to make some decisions later on that is it's, it's really hard like because yeah. you're just you're looking at the sidelines going what should i do yeah. help me help me whereas if you've got that self-drive you've, you're making decisions doesn't mean you're going to get everything right doesn't mean you're going to get it right it's and also you you know i turned to your know, other people you know not my i turned to my my coach at the time you know coaches at the time Chris Akabusi was was a, and still is a, a a confidant of mine. I would always, you know, to talk ask Daley Thompson for an opinion, you know, and mm. you know it wasn't my parents were the last people I was going to talk to. But that that's me, you know. I mean, I mean, some parent you know athlete relationships are fantastic, and we're all different, right? There's no there's no one set way. But I think the important thing is for the for the athlete to understand, you know, what is the best way for me to be motivated? What works for me? And for some, they need their parents with them because they, uh, I feel more confident. And for others, actually, I just need to be left alone. And it's, and I think my, my, my parents, certainly my dad, whether he knew it or not, and I think, I think he must have done. I think he realised that I didn't need him around to motivate me. I just need him, need him there. Yeah. When you're speaking to the other athletes, so yeah. like confide in them or get that confidence, like your confidence you just said, but yeah. uh, what what sort of things are you going to them and, and asking them or talking to them about? Well, look, big decisions, you know, I mean, you know, do it. So, so I look back over my career and you look at the sort of the, the defining moments of your career. And I don't mean the moments you stood on the rostrum or the moments you won the races. I'm talking about the decisions you took, which you at the time you took, but you look back now and you realize that was a pivotal decision. And I, um, in the early days, um, when myself and Chris Akabusi were sort of, you know, starting to really run fast and get noticed, we were invited by Daley Thompson, who was, you know, literally, you know, God in, in, yeah. in you know, he was, he just won his second Olympic title, 84, I'm, I'm talking now 1985. I mean, Wow. And he invited us to go and train with him in California. He had a place out there. He would spend four months of every year out there. He took a shining to, he loved Chris. You know, Chris and him were, 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 were tight. I came along, he, he took a shining to me. He said, come come out. We had no money. Yeah. You know, and then we did, you know, and it's like, 
And we went back to our coach and, and the group and said, look, well, yeah, Daly's invited us out. And they go, no, 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 you were going to stay. You've got to stay here. You've got to do that. And I remember Chris and I going back and we, and we were so, we became, we we're amazing because we were so different. And suddenly we, we just, you know, you meet someone in your life that is so different to you. Yet you you have this shared vision, the shared goal, this shared talent. And suddenly, you know, everything different about you is is irrelevant and and celebrated you realize how similar you are as people mm. and we needed each other we yeah we we need each other so we would we made that decision together we decided together we're gonna go no um, you know the group didn't want us to go the coach didn't want us to go we had no money and we got on a plane we went and lived in a, a motel that cost about five dollars a day we, we rented a car for a dollar a day oh. and um and and basically we to change our lives. I mean, we spent four weeks there and and the rest is history. You know, just being around the great man and all the other people just being there. But I wouldn't have made that decision without Chris. So it's it's you know, he you know, we made those decisions together. You know, I didn't turn to my dad and ask. You know, it was it was Chris who I asked. Yeah, it's 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 in it's interesting in a, in a singular sport, in a team sorry, yeah. like a, an individual sport where yeah, you have right. like this team mentality there that you're looking out for each other. But, but Lewis, that, that's why I didn't do athletics as a kid, because I saw it as an individual sport. When I took it up and joined the training group, I realized it's an individual. You're an individual when you step on the track. But mm. my God, it's a team sport off the track. You know, the, the level of training that you're doing with a group of people and the physical pain you go through with those people, everyone with a different le talent level, different you know, ability level, different dream. Some going to the Olympics, some just to make the club team, you know. Mm. But that was a team. I mean, that was a team. And, you know, there, there is no such, I mean, corny as this is sound, there, there is no such thing as an individual sport. There just isn't. But uh, it, it, it was, it, it, I always had people with me on the journey. They were my team. I just wasn't, apart from when we ran a relay, I just wasn't performing with them. Yeah. So I want to uh, touch on something I read about you having a heart condition when you were yeah. younger. And yeah. if you don't mind just describing what That's that fine. was and, and talking about it and when you yeah, actually so, discovered so I, it. I, I, I was born with congenital heart disease, which sounds very <laughs> serious. Um, and which basically means one of my valves doesn't work. My aortic valve doesn't close. I have a leaking heart valve. And a lot of people have leaking heart valves, but you know, it's not good. So it was discovered when I went to secondary school i had a uh, it was heard by this school doctor i was then referred to a cardio uh, a cardiologist in southampton and i've seen a cardio a specialist cardiologist every year of my life since i was 11 years old so that's 46 years once a year i wasn't a, it was it was a scare it was a huge scare and no i wasn't uh, I, I felt fine it was no problem but i but i had it and so i wasn't allowed to do competitive sport for quite a few months um, and maybe this is another reason why I didn't do athletics seriously as a kid, because because of this, you know, maybe. And yeah, that's it, really. It has not been a problem for me. I've had a couple of couple of scares, but it was fault. They were both false alarms. Yeah, that's it. I'm more aware of it now at 57 than I was yeah, then. Right. But it was always there. Chris knew about it. My dad worried about it all the time. But I got checked up every year. My heart, you know, there are no surprises in my heart. It's been checked up every year. So... <laughs> But every time I went, I you know I would go down to Southampton. I still do. It doesn't matter now. But I go down to Southampton General Hospital. I have all the tests done. I sit in the waiting room and I get called into the room. And I was always very aware that there was a chance that, that they would say, "I'm really sorry, but it's changing." Because I won't go into the detail. You can. You, it's how the heart changes over time, and you're going to have to stop. And um, and they never said it. You know. Wow. So yeah, I mean, it's 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 fine. I never really thought about it. I never talked about it. I never, I, I never, I really didn't think about it because I didn't want it to be an excuse. And it and, and I, it did. It just hasn't been a problem for me at all. But it is there. Yeah. <laughs> so, is it, is it, yeah. So it, my insurance policies are pretty high. <laughs> they just have, <laughs> yeah. It's, not, the, it's a bit of annoying actually. <laughs> was there was there any moment where you thought oh, I'm gonna fall on like use it as an excuse or like no because no. there'd be so many people that could like go nah, oh, you, what, you can't is... i mean as you can, well how can you you know i mean you know no nah, no nah, nah. it doesn't you know, well it's this that we 
No, no, because it, uh, there was, I didn't, I wasn't aware of it physically. It wasn't, it wasn't there. It might have even helped me, by the way, because what's happened is my, I have a, quite a big heart. So the muscles overcompensated for its inefficiency. So, so there is an art, it's a theory, but there's a theory yeah, okay. that my heart has overcompensated for its inefficiency. And that might have helped me because so I've had a very, very slow pulse and a very good recovery, as most athletes do. But, yeah. you know, it was, um, it's, it's, yeah, it was never, never a problem. So. Interesting. Look, I, I'm interested to know who you've spoken about the guys you worked with and yeah. that the were in your team, but sort of people who potentially really great mentors and, and role models that you had yeah. at the time that you were yeah. maybe aspiring to be and, and looked up to. Well, I mean, people can be mentors and insp ins inspirational without knowing it. So I've yeah. mentioned him, I mentioned him many times, Daley Thompson. I'm a great believer that we're all, we're all different. We're all unique in our way. Yet when you're performing at the highest level in sport, you have a shared gift, shared talent. You know this, and yet you're different. And I think we can all learn from each other. And, and as long as you, are, you can take a little bit from somebody that you don't necessarily have or you can improve, then you can become better. And mm. so Daly, for example, just, just, I just was never going to ever be as passionate about athletics as he was or as competitive as he was as a person. Because no, I mean, he's unbelievable. I mean, but, but I, could, I could take bits of that from him. So, you know, daily, definitely. Chris, Chris is different because I, I, he wasn't a mentor. He was, a, he was my, my best friend. He was my training partner. But I so he wouldn't say he was a mentor. He was a teammate as well. Yeah. Right? He's, yeah. Um, I only really had one mentor. And it was actually towards the end of my career. So my career was started very well, then broken foot and ups and downs and injuries did well, whatever. But the missing piece for me was the Olympic, individual Olympic medal. And I had one more shot at that. And that was Atlanta in 96. And as we got towards Atlanta in 96, Chris had retired. I was not alone. I had other training partners, but it wasn't the same. I was coming towards the end of my career. My relationship with my coach was good personally, but I kind of, we'd done our, it got me as far as we could go. There comes a point where you've kind of been around long enough to know what you're doing and you have to take accountability. And the missing piece for me who became my mentor was an athlete from the past who had, who had messed up at the 400 metres. It's a guy called David Jenkins, quite infamous, actually, um, a, lot old, a bit older than me. I met him through daily um, and he messed up. He got to the, he should have won Olympic medals, but he didn't. He messed up. He, uh, he took drugs for a year of his career, which isn't good, but it's back in the sort of you know, 70s or whatever, and had a lot of regret, but and a huge amount of knowledge about the sport. And we just got chatting and, and it was quite clear that I could have a conversation with him. I couldn't have with anyone else because he knew the 400 metres inside out, back to front in a way I did. And we just talked about the event in a way I'd never, ever spoken to anyone. Even Chris, we'd never gone to that level because even Chris would say, you know, he wasn't a world class 400 meter runner. He became a world class hurdler and he was a great 400 meter runner. But he was never going to run the Olympic final. And Jenks became someone on the end of the phone who I and, and the reason it worked and it wasn't for long, by the way, and it was just chatting. But the reason it worked was. He said something to me that I say to athletes that I mentor. And I don't know if you can relate to this, but he said mm -hmm. to me, I said to him, look, you know, could, could, could you help? You know, could you, could you get involved? He said, well, I'm, he's not a coach. You know, he said, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'd love to be involved, but you need to know one thing, he said. Whether you win Olympic medal or not doesn't affect my life. Not at all. Not one bit. I, honestly, whether you do well or you not does not affect my life. And you need to know that. That was the most liberating thing anyone had ever said to me because everyone else around me, my coach, my, my family, my training partner, everyone in my life, if I did well, it, it indirectly or directly affected them. My, it, you know, it made me happy, it made me sad. It, it you know, made my coach see one of the best, best coaches. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it gave them for pride him, in themselves or what him, part they and played. What, but what he was saying to me was, when we talk, I, I, I will give you uh, my complete and utter honest opinion mm. but, but i don't give a shit and, and i don't it didn't mean that badly because what so what for me on the other side was he was giving unconditionally not because it wasn't like an agent who wanted me to do this or a coach needed needed me to do well he wasn't he was just being honest 
he said it as it was. He gave me his opinion and I could choose what to do with it. It was the missing piece of the puzzle. It was the missing piece of the puzzle. And um, that, that was the only real mentor, true mentor. Because I think a mentor is not a coach. I think a mentor should not be involved day to day with what you're doing. A mentor should, a good, should be detached, should really be, you know, you know kept, have knowledge, have wisdom, but not be too involved. And it liberated me because it, it was my, he was my secret weapon in my head. <laughs> he was, he was, he was mine, you know, mm, and, yeah. uh, and it, it made such a difference to me. It's, it's actually really interesting with the work I do now, with coaching athletes and, and anyone is that I am attached, detached from their organization. Yeah. And, yeah. and obviously organizations will have their own sort of view on why someone there or maybe feel like slight, maybe slightly um, protective in that sense. But yeah, it, it is purely from my, the, the feedback is that they allow, I'm not involved. I have no, yeah. I have no real say in anything that's going on in that organization, yeah. but I only care about them. I literally I only care about and them. And I think that is so liberating yeah. for the individual. And unfortunately, from my experience, a lot of coaches didn't, don't like that. Yeah, I, I think the bit you said about unconditional love to yeah. the athlete that I yeah. can even think about my career is that I didn't really have that go-to person that was outside of yeah. the sport. I was always in fear of going to the coach to ask a question, to be yeah. open, but with really in my mind, whether it was true or not, I don't know mm. because you're just making up a story and that could be true or false, but mm. I'm going there thinking if I bring this forward, then I'm potentially going to get judged or thought of in a Correct. certain way. And Correct. that's what I don't want. I, and so I don't say anything. Therefore I yeah. don't say anything because yeah. I'm risking yeah. it all on making yeah. that decision. And, so, and yeah. And my and my relationship with him was was actually um, I mean, Chris knew, Daly knew, but it was it was a secret. It wasn't something I publicised. And that mm. was okay. Mate, he was pretty infamous at the time. So yeah, there's there's all of that. Okay, but but the the, the thing for me was that I would learned from that is that conventionally in life, if you're setting, if you if there's a young athlete or a young sports person listening to this, okay. And they want to go on the journey to be a cricketer or be an athlete or whatever. The natural thing to do, the person you've got to seek out, and this is conventional wisdom, go and find somebody who has done what you want to do and ask them how they did it. Obviously. OK, now that's great. And I did that all the time. OK, but I think there's a better person to search and they're harder to find. Because they will probably be hiding and it will be the person who who went out to do what you wanted to do, but it failed. They didn't achieve it. For whatever reason, they didn't. And that's the person I found. Because that person will offer you, that person has to complete their journey. That person will offer you, they'll tell you the stuff they got wrong, not tell you all the stuff they got right. They will be as, as passionate, if not more, as the person who reached the heights and, and great, and on, on I great. So, you know, that, that, that's, that's what I had in my camp and, and it, it really helped me. But they'll also yeah. be probably really humble in the bits that you're trying to hide from, which yeah. is the failures, yeah. right? So the feeling yeah. of not getting the success. So yeah. everyone's worried about not having that. And if you've got someone in your corner that's felt the pain, the anguish of all of yeah. that, then that is going to have been an experience that that big bravado, non, never lost in their time, has, has kind of never felt really. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, absolutely. And often I in sport, you know, when we achieve, we don't really know how, you know, we wow. But when we yeah. when we fail, when things have gone wrong, we really feel it. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. really, really feel it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, those yeah. are the moments we can learn the most, you know, and and turn and, and learn out of that. So such an interesting point. So so yeah. interesting. But you you were famously in the era of Michael Johnson. So you and him yeah. are intertwined forever now. <laughs> I spoke to him yesterday. It's perfect. So yeah. I think... Yeah. Well, I, as I say that, I know, we, we, we messaged each other. He messaged me yesterday. And that's uh, about about something. To, to, we, are, we, are, we are connected. It's yeah, simple. you are intertwined. Yeah. What yeah. was that era like racing with him? Well, and... it's a, it's a, it's, it was a strange one in that sometimes someone comes along who is just so much better than the rest of the world that you know many people said well clearly he's on drugs <laughs> okay i'm not i don't think he was i'm older than mike i've been i've been around before he came on to the circuit but i remember the day he came on he was a 200 meter runner and you could mm -hmm. just tell this this was different we hadn't seen this before this was somebody who was 
just a level of speed and then took it to the 400. So he is the first truly, true world-class 200-meter runner who took on the 400. Now they all, right? Mm. But Michael was the first two and then famously went to do the double in Atlanta, which he did. So when he won the gold, in, I came second to him in Atlanta. And then a few days later, he won the world, the 200 and broke the world record. The truth is, I never came close to beating Michael. He paid me the greatest compliment of my, my life, no doubt about it. So, so in 96, he crosses the line to win the gold medal in the 400 metres. I'm trailing behind, but I, win, I managed to win the silver. Could easily not have been there, could easily not have medal. So I'm a, I am truly fulfilled, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Job done. If you're going to come second to someone, it's okay. It's Michael Johnson, right? It wasn't going to happen, right? Unless, I mean, he could have got injured. I mean, I never thought I couldn't win. I just knew that ultimately to win, I had to run my perfect race and he had to mess up. But it didn't happen. Fine. So what happens is you cross the line, do your lap of honour, and then you go down and underneath the stadium. And then, I don't know if it was before or after the medal ceremony. It, was, it must have been before. We, or, I don't know. We, we then, no, it must have been after. So then we, you go to have a press conference. Now, this was a big deal because it's Michael Johnson in Atlanta. And you walk into the, before you go into this hall where the world's press are there, and the world's press were there because it was Michael, the three medalists get put into a little ante room. And in that ante room, there are three chairs, gold, silver, bronze. And I walk into to the room and Michael is sitting there and the guy from Uganda who can't quite believe he's just won a little bit bronze medalist there. And I sit next to Michael in the chair next to him and he's, sh he's shaking his head. And he's got his hand in his head. He's going, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. It's just because of his moment, the first moment he had, you know, on, on, on his own. I said, what, what, come on, Mike, what? what do you mean you don't believe it? I said, come on, really? And he looked me in the eyes and I, and I remember exactly what he said. He said, Roger, I've raced you all of my career and you were never going to give me this medal. I was just so taken aback. Mm -hmm. So what, because what he was saying there was, I have to race you. Yeah. I, I, and I know I'm better than you, and, uh, and the times will tell you I'm, I'm like near, you know over a second, nearly a second faster than you. But he said, "I always know I have to race you," because I was a racer, by the way. I didn't always run the fast times, you know, around the circuit, but put me in a championship. Yeah. It's like Akabusi. We're racers, okay? Mm. Pressure's on now. Let's race. Not, you know. So you're going to beat guys who may have beaten you leading up to the championship because they can do it once, but they can't. You know what I mean? So there's a bit more to it. Than that. But when Michael said that to me, it was the greatest compliment ever paid to me because he was miles better than me. <laughs> and, it, and it wasn't negative thinking. I, I honestly took him out of the equation. He, that was the hard thing to do. The hard thing to do when you're up against someone like that is, is to take them, out of the, take them out of your head. Um, you know, and in the Olympic final, the hardest thing to do in the Olympic final is to just hand over and when the gun goes to, to, to run with 80,000 people and, 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 and the stakes are so high because mm. it's once every four years. 100%. Okay. So, and in that race, there are, on the day, let's say there are five people who can win the medals, right? So you don't know, you know, you've got to deliver. You can't mess around. And it, it, uh, it was, yeah, I mean, it just all came together. It just all came together. But, but I can honestly tell you, Michael was in the lane outside me, but I, you, know, you, you are affected by him being there, but you can't run his race. Um, unfortunately, I didn't, and I hung on. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird thing because you're conditioned to want to win. But the question is, what is winning? Yeah, so, so this is an so, interesting yeah, part so, of it. You know, my logical, my emotional brain would say, I want to win the Olympic gold medal. I want to be Olympic champion. But my little voice in my head would have said, shut up. It's my, don't be stupid. I mean, Michael Johnson, come on, really? So what I had to do was redefine winning. And for me, winning was clear what winning was. I had no control over the outcome. Because you don't. Okay? You don't. You, I can't touch the other guys. I have no control over how the other guys perform. Okay? So for me, winning was walking off the track, knowing I'd run my perfect race and there was nothing left. And I did that. And fortunately, I got a silver medal, which also reflected it as well. So I, th I think that was going to be, you've almost answered where I was going to go yeah. with that ne the next part, which was how hard is it to motivate yourself when you are competing with someone like that, where you, like you said there, is like, he's got to mess up oh, in order was, for you to beat him. But was Because my, 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 my goal wasn't to win the Olympic gold medal. 
Yeah. My goal was to run my perfect race at the, in the Olympic final. And that means I could have got a gold medal. I could have got a silver medal. I could have got a bronze. I could have come fourth. Yeah. But the only one of those things I could control was running my perfect race. I can't, I can't, I can't. And I know this is obvious and it's what you will hear after, on every interview in some shape or, or, or other at the highest level in, in at the Olympics, because everyone's yeah. saying it, they're just saying it a different way. We all know that. I can't, I can't really influence you in, in a race where I'm, we're not even in the same lane. Right? Yeah. 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 It's so hard. It's so hard for people to sometimes grasp that thinking as well, though, because they, it's really hard for them to not see the shiny object, to see the extrinsic motivation and reward it's, and recognition and then think, well, if I don't achieve cruel. that, then I'm failed. But it's in, cruel. It's yeah. so cruel. It is, sport is so cruel. And, and therefore, unless you're wired a certain way and you can deal with that cruelty and that, you know, only one person can cross that line first. There are people who go to the Olympic Games every four years who are the most talented athletes in the world for Team GB, let's say. And they come back and they didn't win a medal and people go, oh, it's worse than that now because we win so many medals. If you didn't win a gold medal, you're no good. I mean, it's mm. it's, but you have to just all you can all you can control is your performance. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, it's 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 well, you must know it in team sport. You can have mm. the oh. game of your life and still lose. Yeah, I think a lot of but, what I wish I knew, but I wish I know now that I'd had been spoken to me when I was younger is the amount of things that are not in my control, but I was trying to control them. And yeah. that created stress, frustration, anxiety, 100%. because especially in a team, in a sport like cricket, where as much as I can put in the best performance, I can, I can do everything to the letter and then go and execute my skill and actually nail it. But yeah. then the person on the other end has an absolute blinder <laughs> and matches it. And then I look yeah. like an idiot, yeah. but then it creates the self doubt. And you're like, oh my God, yeah. have I done the right thing? And it, it's it's having that strength of character and ability to just recognize what is in my control, what is not. Correct. And if it, and can I be really honest with myself in the fact that I've done what I wanted to do, I executed what I wanted to execute. And then actually the only thing that happened after that was it's like luck on the other end or opposition, yeah. environment yeah. have changed. Luck's a big part of this game. Huge. And, yeah. and I think you can you can just tear yourself to shreds when you've had a great performance, yeah. but not achieved the outcome that you were really hoping for. I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, That's I mean, my, my, my business partner, Steve Backley, won a bronze medal in, in Barcelona, which was a failure. He was a world record holder. He won a silver medal in Atlanta, and he should never have been there. He tore his Achilles tendons three months, three months out. It was an incredible story. It's an incredible performance. He won an Olympic silver medal on one throw, okay? In Sydney... He threw an Olympic record. And that was his goal. Throw an Olympic record. I can, I can, I can work that one out. Before. He threw an Olympic record. And then his arch nemesis, a guy called Zanzale Yang Zalesny, nicked a couple of centimetres above it in the last round or whatever to, to take the gold medal from it. And it just, it's the best example of, the guy smashed it. The guy threw an Olympic record. The guy could not have done any better, but he didn't get the outcome. He didn't get what he wanted. Mm. And it hurt. It hurt. But that's what, I mean, we all learn that through experience. I'm not saying if there are any young kids listening, you, know, you don't want to put them off. Because the overlying thing for me, even now as I look back, but certainly when I was doing it, no matter what I did, was I was, I was one of the lucky ones. Lewis, you were one of the lucky ones. I was one of the lucky ones. All my mates would have swapped it to have had a chance of competing for their country in any sport. I, I was like... Everyone who, who competes internationally or professionally in sport, you're one of the lucky ones because you were, yeah, you were given the, the you were, you had a shot at it. You had a degree of talent. I'm not saying it's all talent. You have to work at talent, of course. Yeah. It's not all talent, but but not everyone gets that. Not everyone has got that ability to even have a chance. Yeah. Okay, so so you know, what's the what's the option? Don't go for it because yeah. the odds are you're not going to make it. The odds are. You're not going to win the medal because, of course, but that does that shouldn't stop you going for it, surely. Yeah, because someone's, but... got, to, someone's got to do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I like. I always like def when I was thinking about growing up. I always used to think that I was trying to define myself by the character rather than the outcome. So I was like, I'd rather be known as the character who had a crack at it than 
Really? The that's, that actually... oh, that's it. Okay, so that's an interesting one. Yeah, okay. I, I was really trying to, I, I really did some reflection on what I was trying to do. And I had these goals and ambitions, but I focused so hard on the person that I wanted to be and this character that I was trying to create because I believed if I created that character, if I create this person, then there's a really high chance that I could actually get what I wanted to get. And I was drawing upon a range of different stories from multiple different sports and disciplines, especially underdogs. I really looked for underdogs, yeah, people yeah. that had been told no, they couldn't do it or came from strange backgrounds, had conditions or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. And I draw upon those because I was like, I think if I can create this character, if I can create this person that I, that I think is strong, is able to deal with setbacks, can, can be regarded as that, that type of character, then there's a chance that they're going to have a really good opportunity or chance of even sure. getting in compared to not creating that character. So that was really my my That's way of, of doing it. Yeah. But was that character when you were was that the authentic you or was it is it you know what, you that, be someone else? There was there was parts where I wasn't. There was parts where I wasn't. Yeah. And I think I was tapping into multiple different parts of me. When I yeah. actually became when I became a pro, there was a sort of pivotal moment where I'd spent the early years of getting into the sport professionally emulating other players that I wanted to take mm. whether that was technical tactical things like mm. that that I was trying to do things similar like but actually I got to a certain part and I went I've not created what I feel is my own best version of me in this mm. sport and that's on the field I felt when I was off the field I was me and I was being myself and there was other parts where I was not being myself and yeah, I like I mentioned, I didn't really have the guidance or I was kind of figuring it out myself. I had yeah, the coaches yeah, that were there and yeah. I wish I'd had a mentor that someone that yeah. could talk to. I didn't really talk to my yeah. parents about it loads. Yeah. And and I think, yeah, there's there's things that I would do differently now. There's definitely things that I would have well, we tried all. out. But yeah, right. Yeah. And and yeah. I, I think but most of all that I am just actually proud and happy with this character that I was creating. I, I am proud of that person. I am yeah, proud yeah. of this kid because yeah. I, I look back at it and go, yeah, well, even when I'm 80 years old, right, I'm going to look yeah. back and go, yeah, no, he was a good kid. He was trying hard. And, and I, I get that. I get people actually giving me compliments of the type of person I was rather than the player I was. And I actually think that's a, when you're finished, it's a nicer compliment to get sometimes because sure. you want to sure. be told you're the best, you're fastest, sure. you're the strongest, you're the sure. quickest. But sure. actually, did you have a good impact on people? Did you... Yeah, because you make people feel right. That for me has been mm. something that I've I've been mm. proud of. You, may, I want to just come back to something I put a pin in, which was running with fast people. Yeah, and you yeah. were you were pushing yourself with people who mm. were better than you. Talk mm. me through the way of thinking there, and and sort of the what well, you felt were the benefits of doing that. I I just if I get asked by parents, you know, I've got a really talented kid. They they want to do athletics, they want to do a sport. You know what 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 advice do you? What should we be doing? And what they want me to say is, you know, nutrition, kit, text, you know, something complicated. And I always say the same thing. I said, it's quite simple with running. If you want to run fast, you just got to go and run with fast people. It's one of the hardest things. That's why geography plays a huge part, because you don't know how good you are until you find out. And that's why so many people who are told how good they are as kids, then suddenly run with fast people. They get beaten. They've never been beaten. And they give up because yeah. they go, oh, I'm rubbish. No, you're not rubbish. You just don't, you've just not had to, there's a level of performance you've not had to go to. Keep going. You, you, can, you can source it. So for me, I, I, I absolutely, I mean, it's, 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 it's my nature anyway. I don't work well on my own. I'm not very, I'm not very good in, in business or in, in, in life. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm okay, but I'm better with other people. I've, I'm better when I'm working alongside other people. But yeah, just just joining Todd Bennett, Chris Akabusi, and all these other guys, and then and then chasing them and chasing them, and it's just I was chasing them, and then I caught them, obviously. But to have them alongside, and then we took each other to a level of a, a level of performance that we would never have accessed on our own, hmm. because it, and it's not a conscious thing. It's not a conscious thing. It's a it's a you just do it because you're surrounded by other people doing it, and before you know it. You're running faster and faster and faster, and you're all taking each other there. It's all relative, but you know, I'm me and Chris and Todd are out front, but the guys behind are still behind, but they're running faster. And they're not thinking, they're just doing. Mm -hmm. The problem with a lot of sport is you overthink it. 
you know it's a nat- you know, just do it especially especially the hard training which is you, really hard you've just got to get in there and do it so i've always surrounded myself with with people now now towards the end of my career that became a little bit harder because th- there weren't like people who were a lot faster than me mm. but I always looked at, so right towards the end, a guy called Mark Richardson joined my training group, who was younger, fitter, faster. And then I retired and he, you know, he started to beat me and you and Thomas started to beat me. And I don't regret that. I don't regret that because I was, I was just hanging on. I'd done it. I'd done. But, you know, it was hard, but I didn't need, I didn't need it anymore. So it was okay. But I, I do think it is such an important thing, as simple as it sounds. I do think you've got to go out. And if it means you've got to jump on a plane and go to another country, if it means Kelly Holmes won two gold medals in Atlanta, in uh, Athens in, 19, in 2004. Amazing. Which, mm-hmm. One of the reasons he did that is that a year before, she jumped on a plane and went and trained with the fastest runner in the world, a woman called Maria Matola. It's not complicated, <laughs> mm. but you've got to do it. Yeah. So, um, and it takes a degree of humility to do it as well, of course, because because you run the risk of not being as good as them. And and totally. Yeah. So but when it really works is when it is and say myself and Akabusi be an example of this, where. You know, now we weren't he did. He left the 400 meters, so we weren't direct competitors. So maybe that's why it works even more. But you know that ultimately, if you want to get to there. This person is going to take is going to you're going to do it with this person, but by you going there, they're going to go there, and they might go better than you. But if you want to go there, and that's the way to go there, that's 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 the risk you got to take. Yeah, there's so many. I think, especially, I think for young people right now, it's really hard for them to to want to do that, to be seen as the slowest in a group, to be seen as the one that's that's uh, not the the mainstay yeah. athlete in the group right because there's so much around the accolades that come with that and the sure. public recognition but if you can just be strong enough to stay in a group and know that you're learning off the best you're developing from the best you don't you're not going to be the best in that group that's at some stage it will kick in at some yeah. stage trust yeah. it like i did it it was I, I would constantly try and surround myself with like who's the best who's there i'm gonna yeah literally have to cop it here a little bit and and be sort of frowned upon as being not as good as everyone else but what i'm getting as a trade-off from that is just so much stronger like it's yeah. it's yeah. unfan and i i hate seeing young people putting themselves in that whether it's in their own age group or and and dominating that arena i'm like as soon yeah. as you're dominating that arena get, yeah, get out get, get, like, get out of the arena. best thing for get me was playing zone best thing for me was playing cricket at 14 in a men's team like yeah. playing at 14 and being oh, around grown men the ball flying around hearing people sort of abuse you in a way that's like makes yeah. you resilient and dealing yeah. with the stuff that is going to come when you're older right yeah. and you're you're sitting there going yeah. okay well this is daunting but i've got to do it and the reason for it is is that no matter who you are you can never be complacent in sport because you're a long time retired, it's certainly in athletics, you know, you're a long time retired. And every day you cannot be complacent. There's always going to be someone behind you. Steve Backley learned this. I don't know why I'm quoting him what we've heard this podcast, but he uh, he was world record holder and then he lost the world record and he went down. He went backwards for a few years and then he got back to number one in the world. And he said, he says a lot of things have changed, but the biggest change was he learned such the important lesson, which was if you want to stay at number one in the world and continue to be number one in the world you have to live and train as if you're number two in the world oh yeah and there's something in that isn't there you know mm. when i first heard him say that i thought yeah and that's why i i, I came back to michael johnson michael johnson um was supremely talented but i can tell you one thing about michael johnson he was never complacent mm. he respected everyone he never took anything for granted and usain bolt's the same by the way you know these guys you know, to be that good for so long, you have a, you may not see it, but they, they have a, 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 not hum, a humility or an understanding that they never take it for granted. Mm. And, and I think there's something in that. And I think the top performers had that. On the outside, of course, you, you, know, you go, wow, they're so confident. But deep down, it's all about, I'll take the little voice in your head. I'm talking about the quiet moments. I'm not talking about what the public, so good. And, and they're not complacent. I mean, those little voices are, you know, they're, not, they're not taking it easy. And that's why in sport, we have to look at, the 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 Federers of this world, the the 
the the the, the Usain Bolts, the Michael Johnsons, the Mo Farahs. I put Mo in that category. Andy Andy Murray, my God. Yeah. I mean, my God. I mean, this is extraordinary, and this is because deep down, one, they love what they do. They they have yeah. a true passion for it. But second, they're not they're, they're not complacent. They don't take it for granted. Because if you took it for granted, you're going to get found out. And these legends in sport, the long sustainable legends, the ones who, you know, the, the, that you, know, you can add to that list, obviously, in, in cricket, you know, you, you would have a better idea of what that is. I think, I think what differentiates them isn't, isn't just, and they may have a super talent, but I, think, I don't think it, the talent would be the big differentiator. I think the differentiator is they, they just had no complacency. They never took it for granted. And yeah. they, they never rested on their laurels. It's a real and, consistency of character, yeah, I think. When yeah. I see it, you just see these people, they're very level. The highs are high, but they're not, they're never, they don't kid themselves and think that that's going to be up there forever. Huh. They, they just yeah. recognize there's going to be a low coming. Um, yeah. Look, I'm very conscious of yeah, time. So and, and I for a long time. Sorry. No, I really appreciate oh, your time. Yeah. Um, yeah. I always ask people as we wrap up, yeah. what is something that you're recommending at the moment, whether it's a book, a documentary, a quote, or something that you oh, have potentially has, has potentially has inspired you that you would recommend? <laughs> Maybe, yeah, could be a favorite film or movie or book or anything. Right, okay. Um, uh, top of my head. I'm going top of my head current right now. What's inspiring me? And of course, when when this stops and I go, I think, oh, I should have said this, not this. Of course, we all do that. What inspires me? Okay, I've, I've just, uh, the, the new series of Race Around the World started. I don't know if you watched that. No, I haven't watched that. Just random couples have to cross Canada with nothing. And it's fathers and, there's a, two fathers and daughters, there's two brothers. And of course, it's not a race. It's it's not a race to you. I mean, it is, but it's not. It's a, it's a it's a journey of personal discovery and relationships, and uh, I think that is that that does something with me because I look at you know my relate you know the people on the journey with me. So yeah, the Ak- Chris Akabusi will be back to whatever. You, you realise it it is the metaphor for the journey and the change in the people. So it's not a book, it's not a quote. No, it's, I it's love just that. a TV show. But it's something that I think is very popular because it's it's far deeper than just people trying to race across Canada. It's the relationships um, that, that happened through it. So. Yeah, what an awesome so moment. Even if so- you even if you remember something, that was actually brilliant. <laughs> so yeah, that's that. I really love that. I think I'm constantly reminding people like that the the journey is the destination. So that yeah. is genuinely a, that. A, a, pu- a beautiful, beautiful yeah. end. Look, yeah. Roger, thank you so much for your time. Um, if Thanks, people want to find you, tap into what you're up to, where's the best place to send them? Yeah, well, I do a lot of, well, um, the easiest way now is rogerblackfitness.com. So I have my own fitness brand with the bikes and treadmills and whatever. I had that for years now. I run it myself with a small team, which is interesting. Uh, or Backley Black with Steve Backley, and yep. we do a variety of things. But uh, yeah, it's never been straightforward, but uh, no. but uh, it's, it's still there, still hanging I'll, in there. I'll, put links in the show notes for this but look, i really really it's appreciate been it's been fantastic it's been yeah, well, you've been great you've been great so, thanks